very much for the introduction and also thanks to the organizers for inviting me to teach this short course on algorithms in algebraic number theory. Let me start with some logistical notes. First of all, there are lecture notes, including exercises, and there was a moment ago still a stack of them sitting up here, but they are also digitally available, or at least they should be. These notes were written by, let me write down his name, Dan van Gent, who is my TA. He's a graduate student at Leiden. And if you see any imperfections in the notes, please feel free to communicate them to Dan. Dan, maybe you should get up and make sure that people know who you are. I also asked Dan to help me in another way. I am getting quite deaf, so you should certainly feel free to interrupt me if anything is unclear, but it may happen that I won't understand your question, so be sure at least that Dan can hear it so that he can communicate your question to me and I can do my best to answer the question, maybe again with Dan's help, of course. Last year, the corona measures were still in place, but I was nevertheless invited to teach a preparatory course on background uh, for my course, which, and that is something that I really jumped at, at this opportunity. So I've been teaching four or five times uh, on uh, auxiliary material that would be useful to know for this present course. And and this material is also included in the lecture notes. But I'm just curious how many of you actually attended this course last year? Okay, good. Well, so that is a fair number. And uh, the others, they can at least consult the notes. But what I would like to start with today is a brief summary of what I did last year so that you are not lost um, if you did not follow that material. You may have seen that the title of the lecture notes is a little longer. It is polynomial time algorithms in algebraic number theory. But, uh, well, th this subject is so broad that I felt that I had to limit myself. And if you restrict to polynomial time algorithms, then just the right quantity of material is left for teaching for a whole week about this. And let me, just to remind you who were there last year, of one of the theorems that I proved by way of motivation for this course, and that is the following, and I will explain the words of this theorem maybe afterwards. So this is about the existence of algorithms, and this is going to be a polynomial time algorithm. And what does it do? Well, it computes, it simply tests a multiplicative equality between rational numbers. So the input to this algorithm is a sequence of a certain length, t, and that sequence consists of uh, rational numbers, which I call a1 through a t, and they are non-zero rational numbers. So Q star, that is the multiplicative group of rational numbers. And the algorithm also takes as input a sequence of the same length consisting of integers. And what the algorithm does is ac actually very simple. It is yes or no. It decides whether the corresponding multiplicative relation is satisfied, whether the product of 
over i is 1 to t from a i to the power n i is equal to 1. And in particular, you can use this also to test whether two such expressions are equal simply by dividing one expression by the other. So this looks exceedingly simple, but it is also simple enough so that if you do not know already what in practice makes something into a polynomial time algorithm, that you will learn it at least from this example. So let me explain what all these words mean. There is, I guess you know what it means, and that is not an abstract existence proof somehow topologically analyzing the space of algorithms. This is perfectly constructive, and that will be true for every algorithm that I will be claiming the existence of. The proof will always explicitly or implicitly tell you what the algorithm is. Polynomial time, that means means that the time is bounded by a constant times a constant power of what people call the length of the input. And the length of the input that depends, of course, on the way the input is presented. Well, this t that you may as well represent it in unary because the length of the input is certainly going to be at least t. The a's, the ai, you specify them with numerator and denominator, which you write, for example, in base 2. So the length of such a numerator will be essentially its logarithm. And then in addition, of course, you also have a sign, an additional bit. And in the same way, these integers are represented. And then the algorithm starts working. And in time, no more than, well, essentially, the sum of the logarithms, the heights, you might call them, of all these numbers involved, it decides whether or not this relation is satisfied. And I gave also a proof of this last year. And what is maybe more important than the proof is how not to prove it. And uh, let me just to sketch this out, assume, and that is really without loss of generality that all my AI are actually integers, but still non-zero. Clearly, you can replace each AI by a numerator and a denominator and double the number T. So let's just assume that the AIs are integers. And then what you can do in this expression is that you move the negative exponents to the other side so that you may assume that all the n's, the exponents n i, are positive, let's say strictly positive, and then you simply have two such expressions and you can say, well, you simply compute them and uh, compare whether they are equal bit by bit. And that is something that will not be polynomial time because even computing one such number like 13 to the power, a big number, the number of digits, will be proportional to that number itself and not to its logarithm. So that will simply take up too much time. And then you can try to apply some of the standard devices that people use in such circumstances. For example, you can uh, say that you test that equality modulo a bunch of auxiliary numbers and well, you may think about it and you will discover that it will still not be fast enough. Another way is using transcendental number theory and use theorems from Baker theory saying that if two such expressions are different, then they actually have a sizable difference so that you can maybe do this computation in only limited accuracy. And I once did the computations there many years ago, and I believe that I decided that that had a good chance of working when t is fixed. But then as the number of numbers goes up, then it stops being polynomial time. There is a second way 
in which one does not prove this theorem, and that is by factoring all the AI into prime numbers. And then what you do is that you simply decide this equality, well, apart maybe from checking that the sign is valid by simply comparing the prime factorizations of these numbers. And then the dependence upon the exponents is now indeed quite modest. You just do some arithmetic with the exponents, but you don't write down these huge numbers. But now the problem is really sitting in the AI themselves because prime factorization is a problem for which no polynomial time algorithm has been invented yet. In the future, of course, if you guys work hard enough, that may change. So the real way in which one proves this theorem is, as with so many things, by going back to Euclid. Last week in my lecture, I d discussed several subjects that go back to Euclid, and so did Joe Silverman. Several of you must have bought the book Space, I think it is called, is that true, by Jordan Ellenberg. And if you have also opened it up, you may have seen that the title of the first chapter is I vote for Euclid. So let's vote for Euclid. And if you go into Euclid, you look into Euclid's number theory, then you will see that even though he does introduce prime numbers and he derives some of their basic properties and in fact the Merzena primes from last week they were also in his work but there is one thing that is conspicuously absent in Euclid and that is uniqueness of prime factorization. There is the famous theorem about there being infinitely many primes and some people people think that Euclid proved this by supposing that you have only finitely many primes and that you multiply them all together and you add one. Well, that is not what Euclid did. Euclid never multiplied more than three numbers together because, you know, a number is in length and the product of two numbers that is an area and the product of three numbers is a volume and product of more numbers, they were simply not occurring in Euclid's vocabulary. And what he did do for the proof of the existence of infinity many primes is that he did not take the product of all those primes, he took the least common multiple. That is something that he did a lot and in fact notions like GCDs, least common multiples, coprimality, they are much more important in the theory that Euclid set up than the prime numbers are. Maybe he was aware of prime factorization being not polynomial time. Maybe he knew that already, so that your future contributions to the subject may fall through. So what did Euclid do? Euclid, he could give two numbers, A and B, and just think of them for the moment as positive integers. Then he would calculate their GCD, that is the GCD of A and B. And for the purposes of doing this computation, he introduced what other people started calling the Euclidean algorithm. And this is a divisor, both of A and B, a common divisor, and because it is the greatest common divisor, well, since it is a divisor, you can divide it out, and then the result is that you have two numbers which are co-prime. And if you assume these AI to be integers, and if you check the sign, you may as well assume that they are strictly positive, well, greater than one, let's say, then you can do this GCD with uh, any two numbers, and you can repeat it, and you can repeat it, and at the end, what you find, so these two numbers, they are called prime, A over D and B over D are called prime, but it is a mistake to think 
that D itself is also co-prime to A over D or B over D. So here you may again have to compute a GCD and the same here and after a while, but it takes no more than polynomial time, but it is actually, it can become a quite lengthy computation. After a while, you discover what, not a set of prime numbers, but a set of integers greater than one that are pairwise co-prime and that have the property that each of the initial AIs is a power product of the C's. And then what you do is that you use the co-prime base, as it is called, the co-prime base, which depends on your additional initial numbers. You can use it instead of the prime numbers. The co-prime factorization is easy to do, that is to say, in polynomial time for the details uh, I may refer to the notes as I will actually have to do uh, for many proofs during in this course and then you simply compare whether in this product all the exponents at the C on the CIs are equal to zero because if these numbers are greater than one and pairwise co-prime then they are multiplicatively independent so that is the proof in a sketch that I gave um, last year and before I pass to the second subject that I discussed last year let me tell you about another theorem are there any questions in the meantime okay so what I will uh, keep as one of the motivating results of this course is a generalization of this theorem. And what is this generalization? Well, maybe I will just um, uh, modify it by just using an eraser, then we get theorem two. And what I want to do is that I generalize this to number fields. So I put a K star here and number fields, well, it is somehow a tradition, don't ask me why, maybe to honor Euclid that the elements are written with Greek letters, so there we go. But of course the number field should also be introduced and it is important that uh, this number field is not fixed that for every number field you have a polynomial time algorithm no the whole algorithm is going to be uniform in the number field so the number field is uh, part of the input on the input a number field i hope that this is still legible a number field k and the rest, I think, is unchanged, except that this assumption should really go. But I do have to tell you in what manner this number field is going to be specified to the algorithm. And first you have to know what a number field is. A number field is a field that contains the field of rational numbers. In other words, it has characteristic zero and its dimension over the field of rational numbers as a vector space should be finite. And if it is finite, then this field K has a basis. Let's write it as one, the direct sum from one to a certain number, which is called the degree of the number field. And then you have here Q, and then you have here a certain basis vector. That is the description of the edit 
active group of K, and it also tells you how you want to represent the elements of K, such as these alpha i, namely you specify an element of K by means of its coordinates, the vector of coordinates on this basis. So the number of entries of that vector will be the degree of the number field. And then you also need to be able to multiply in the field and divide. And for the, this, the purposes of this, you need multiplication constants. So K and I and J, they are all integers in the same interval from one to the degree. And then you have here certain rational numbers. So this C I J K is a rational number and what you want is that you specify this system of integers so if the degree if I call it n then you can think of this as a three-dimensional matrix so you have a tensor if you like a system of n cube rational numbers that specifies the multiplication at least for the basis vectors but then of course you extend by Q by linearity and then uh, not every system of rational numbers defines a number field but it is not so exceedingly difficult to show that whether or not such a system does define a number field fields can be verified yes or no in polynomial time. There is a fairly straightforward algorithm for this. Uh, maybe it is even in the exercises. Is that true? Okay, Dan says yes, it is in the exercises. So if you've never seen it, then that is a good thing to think about. So for example, you want that this is commutative, CIJK, CJIK, for example. Number fields have to be commutative. So that is the input, and this is a theorem that is far less trivial than the one that I wrote down just for the rational numbers. It is a theorem that was um, proven, I think, in 1994, if I remember right, by uh, Go Chang Ge. He was a graduate student at Berkeley and this theorem is in his PhD thesis. I do not think that it got published but there is a publication in which you do not decide whether this power product is one but whether this power product generates the unit ideal whether it is a unit in the ring of integers of k and that is also something that we will encounter this week this is not a trivial theorem and i will hopefully prove a big chunk of it uh, and uh, I have also seen that this theorem has actually actual applications. People refer to it in, in the context of deciding about equalities between powers of matrices that are uh, commuting with one another. And in fact, this theorem has also been generalized when you replace your number field by any commutative ring that contains a rational number, a Q-algebra, that is again of finite dimension. So a number field, that is the crucial case. In fact, the proof for the general situation that I just mentioned proceeds by reduction to the case of number fields. So this is already a theorem that has some interest.